So where does energy policy fit into all of this? What we're going to do for the next two hours is give you a uh, uh, probably going to be all too brief overview of the issues uh, relating to energy policy in this campaign. So the past, ladies and gentlemen, is prologue. Uh, having heard the president and Governor Romney speak, how did the United States get into the energy situation that we face today? Our next speaker is a gentleman who has devoted much of his professional life to uh, understanding those issues. Jay Hakes is a native of the Midwest. He has a PhD in political science from Duke University. Uh, he has been involved in numerous uh, campaigns through the years, served as the energy director in Florida, and also as the chief of staff to the governor of Florida. And he then went on to become the director uh, of the Energy Information Administration from 1993 to 2000. And EIA, is, as we all know, is the official data disseminator for the U.S. government of energy uh, information and statistics. He currently serves as director right here in Atlanta of the Jimmy Carter Presidential Library and Museum. And I'm sure that uh, you all had an opportunity to hear Jay this morning. I'd also like to point out in introducing him, as he said this morning, he is the author of a Declaration of Energy Independence. And he is going to give us a uh, background now for the next 30 minutes on energy policy in the United States, how we got to where we are today. Jay, thanks for joining us. He didn't mention energy that much. So uh, for those of us in the energy business, this is pretty neat, actually. Uh, I'm somewhat of an economic determinist on the issue. Uh, when prices are high, it's usually uh, part of the debate. When they're low, it's not. Uh, that's unfortunate because we need a sustained uh, attention to energy, but that's uh, the world we live in. Uh, it certainly has changed a lot of our lives. It kind of changes my life when this is in the news because reporters are writing more stories about energy, and a lot of times they'll call up uh, and ask for a quote or something like that. And there's been a new uh, thing this year called PolitiFacts that are running papers around the country where they check the facts of the candidates. And for some reason, those reporters have my telephone number. And those can be long calls because you'll have to say, well, that those data are table 15B of the EI series, and here's where you can find it on the internet. Now we have to divide column B by column C, and and uh, you can look at it at a three-year period or 10-year period, and it'll look different. Uh, but I've enjoyed doing it because I think it is good to try to bring uh, uh, some uh, check. I'm talking. There you go. Okay. Um, so here we are, uh, and. There's a view uh, that I try to argue against. Uh, I argued against a similar view this morning. It's, this one's slightly different. Uh, and the argument is that a lot of presidents ignore energy, and that's why we uh, are in the mess we're in today. Uh, I don't think presidents ignore energy. Um, energy is very intertwined with economic policy. It's very intertwined with uh, uh, foreign policy, particularly the Middle Eastern policy. And it's very intertwined with environmental policy. So no president can really ignore energy. They don't really have that option. And uh, I'm going to try to prove that to you today. And as Brad said, I'm going to start with Abraham Lincoln. And uh, this might be new to you, but I, I think you'll find it interesting. Uh, Lincoln, of course, is about to become more famous than he already is. I mean, he's one of our most famous presidents. But in 10 days, Steven Spielberg will re be releasing a new movie on Abraham Lincoln, which you've probably seen trailers of on TV. So uh, uh, Lincoln will very much be in the news. But Lincoln had an interesting exchange with King Manga, who you actually have heard of, even though you don't know it. 
King Manga was the king of Siam, uh, which today is Thailand. And this is the very king that's in Anna and the King, and the King and I, the movie and the play. And he wrote uh, 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 to America in, in a letter. And we had this letter on display at the Carter Library a few years ago. And the reason we had it was because there was this beautiful Jules sword that he had sent for President Lincoln. But the letter said, I have a proposal for you in which we can help you develop your transportation system. We are willing to send you elephants uh, that can be uh, propagated in North America, and this will provide the uh, transportation system that you need to transverse this very large country that you have, East Coast to West Coast. And um, there, there's a story that appeared on, on the, uh, was prevalent on the web at the time that said that Bunga had sent this letter because he wanted to thank um, Lincoln for freeing the slaves. Now, I immediately found a discrepancy in conventional wisdom because I looked at the date of the letter and it was actually dated before uh, Lincoln was even president. He had actually sent this to President Buchanan, but because of the slow mail delivery at the time, Lincoln was president uh, uh, when the letter arrived. And uh, so I actually wrote an article about this a few years ago and, and now most of the web information is correct. Uh, it was not because uh, Lincoln freed the slaves. Well, when I saw this letter, I got very curious about what Lincoln's response was. And uh, I, I, many people in this room, depending on your age, probably believes that all useful information is on the web somewhere. And uh, when you're doing historical research, that just isn't true. So I actually had to go to the, the, the diplomatic archivist of the United States, the late Milt uh, Gustafson, who was a good friend of mine. I said, can you get me a copy of Lincoln's response? He said, sure. So, you know, a week later, I get a, a copy in the mail of Lincoln. I didn't, he didn't send me the original, but he sent me a copy. And Lincoln writes back and says, we've done a study here in the United States, and it shows that, that uh, elephants will not propagate in North uh, uh, America. So that's really not an option for us. And besides that, we've made a com uh, commitment to steam power. Now, you remember the Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, Lincoln, even before he was president, was a big proponent of the Transcontinental Railroad. You know, they gave a leg land to the uh, rail companies, and whoever built the fastest, they, they would get more mileage, because they started on the west, they started on the east. One was powered by coal, the other was powered by wood. So you had a traditional fossil fuel, you had what today we would call biomass. I guess the uh, if we'd used elephants, they would have been eating biomass, so we would have had a biomass uh, energy policy. So uh, Lincoln had a very clear energy policy that it was, it was important to have uh, a way of getting to the West Coast from the East Coast. Uh, he believed that uh, we could use wood for part of it if wood was in enough supply, but we also needed coal. Uh, and Lincoln also founded the National Academy of Sciences, which continues to this day to be a big player in energy issues when there's a dispute, they call them the National Academy of Sciences. And he founded the land-grant colleges, uh, which, again, do a lot of research today that plays a role in the energy field. Some of you may even work with land-grant colleges, uh, particularly in biomass, for instance. Most land-grant colleges have very strong agriculture programs, so they know a lot about biomass. So Lincoln, uh, in just scratching the surface, had a very robust energy policy. Now, I'm not going to cover all the presidents, <laughs> so I'm going to leap ahead to Harry Truman. And uh, Brad was nice enough to mention my book with its uh, Declaration of Energy Independence. And uh, basically, in the book, I start with Truman. And Truman's policies are very interesting, particularly if you want to compare them with what's going on today. Um, during World War II, we thought we knew where our energy future was headed. We thought that we could not continue to rely on, we, we did not have any net imports at the time. So we thought, the days of being able to rely just on uh, American oil uh, were, were probably going to come to an end at some point. But just before the war, they had discovered major oil supplies in Saudi Arabia. And we became very good friends with the Saudis. Uh, uh, President Roosevelt met with King Faisal, uh, or, uh, uh, King Ibn Saud. Uh, and uh, so uh, it looked like we would have the access to Saudi Arabia much as uh, Great Britain had access to the oil in Iran. And that seemed to be to set us in a good future.
However, we didn't realize that when World War II was over, we were going to have the Cold War. And if we were going to have a Cold War and there was another major power and it wasn't much further away from, or any further away from Saudi Arabia than we were, then at some point we might need to not rely on Saudi Arabia. So it was classified information at the time. It's only been in recent years that we know what this part of the policy was. But we developed contingency plans where we could move quickly into Saudi Arabia if we thought the Soviets were about to take over and we would uh, destroy the wells there. And if we thought the Soviets were going to stay for a long time, we would really destroy the wells there uh, by cementing them in and making them almost impossible to resume production. But if we thought we could oust the Saudis pretty quickly, we would uh, do more temporary damage. And, and this was well thought out and was part of our contingency plan. So uh, at that time, energy was a big, big uh, issue because uh, access to oil had helped us defeat Germany and uh, Japan, and we wanted to continue that access. Along those lines, uh, the Interior Department uh, made a proposal to the President and Congress, they said we can provide energy independence. We can do that a couple ways. We can take uh, coal and we can gasify it, and, or we can turn it into liquid fuels. Uh, and that, often these are called SIN fuels, if, if you, uh, not S-I-N, but uh, S-Y-N. Uh, synthetic fuels, uh, and, and we could do it that way, much as the Germans and the Japanese had uh, their own SIN fuel production during World War II. And they said there's another way we can do it, and that's through the shale formations. Now these are the same shale formations that we're talking about today. They were aware they were there. And they had very um, optimistic, probably overly optimistic views of how much it would cost to bring this on. So uh, Truman was sort of interested in this, and they sort of pushed it, but they didn't push it uh, real hard, in part because they were looking at another way that they thought might provide energy independence, and this was nuclear power. And if you look at the history of the nuclear, peaceful civilian nuclear use in this country, it comes out of the U.S. Navy. Uh, then Captain, later Admiral uh, Rickover, developed the nuclear Navy. One of the officers that was working for him was a fellow named Jimmy Carter, uh, worked on the, uh, um, the, the second uh, nuclear um, uh, sub. And the idea all along was that uh, the work would be done jointly with the Atomic Energy Commission and the Navy, and the technology would be made available for the development of civilian nuclear power. And the, uh, the first uh, sub was launched, I think, in 52, um, and the first uh, nuclear uh, civilian power plant was in 1957 in Shippingsport, uh, Pennsylvania. So uh, Truman is, really gets nuclear started. So you've got a couple options here. You've got the SID fuels, you've got the, 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 uh, the shale oil and gas, and you've got nuclear as ways of not being dependent on foreign oil. Another issue that was going on was price controls. Uh, there were price controls on natural gas, and Truman got right in the middle of that debate. He generally favored keeping price controls on interstate sales of natural gas, although uh, he's not quite as wedded to that position as most uh, historians think he is. But another one that's more relevant uh, in my final sort of Truman thing that's relevant today was what are we going to do about offshore drilling and drilling on federal lands? You heard it right there in the debate. Back in those days, uh, Truman took the position, and he was supported by the Supreme Court, that all offshore drilling was controlled by the federal government. But the federal government had no laws in place to permit offshore drilling. So you were saying, well, the states can't drill, and but the feds really can't either. But uh, Truman sort of felt that the Fed government had sort of a proprietary role over this, that we didn't need the oil right now, we shouldn't rush into it, uh, let's develop it later when we really need it. Uh, and uh, he dug in his heels so much that he declared uh, these uh, by rule, executive order, that all offshore drilling was uh, terminated and would become sort of a national trust that would be saved for the next world war. Uh, that then we'd start producing it when we needed the oil for national security uh, purposes. He fought this uh, very vigorously with Eisenhower in the 1952 election, and Eisenhower was elected. So I'll segue to, to Eisenhower. But Truman, who, you know, you'll read David McCullough's book on Truman, which is our most famous book. You won't find any reference in there to his energy policies. But he had them. And he, they, they consumed a lot of his time, and a few of them are still the issues we're dealing with today. 
Now, Dwight Eisenhower, um, uh, in cooperation with Congress, brought in the Outer Continental Leasing Act, which led to the development of the Mobile Platform. In offshore drilling, they used to have fixed platforms. Well, when you drill for offshore oil and gas, um, a lot of them are dry holes. So you've lost a whole well. Um, so you want a mobile platform that can do the exploratory drilling uh, before you start production. So that technology was developed um, about that time. Um, and at that time, they were working at depths of water of about 80 feet. Uh, today, uh, they go to 10,000 feet of water. And, and if you take into account the, how much further they go below, there have been a few wells that are uh, 30,000 feet depth, more or less the, the depth equivalent to the height of a commercial aircraft flight. So we've come a long way since then. Uh, Eisenhower also uh, kept up the emphasis on nuclear. He uh, had the Atoms for Peace program, uh, trying to uh, show that although the, the nuclear power had been developed for military uses, it had many other uses as well. He also faced disruptions, to uh, potential disruptions to Middle Eastern uh, oil because of the uh, 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 overthrow of the Shah of Iran, uh, which led uh, for a while to a big cutoff in oil. Well, actually, uh, the British organized a boycott of Iranian oil. We're boycotting Iranian oil today, sounds familiar. Uh, but it took that oil off the world market. And then this, there was a war over the Suez Canal. And the United States at that time had the ability to increase its um, oil production on a short-term basis. Uh, and um, this gave us tremendous leverage in the world because the Europeans couldn't give us much grief because they depended on us for, for their extra oil when they got cut off like they did at Suez. But Eisenhower was mad at the British and the French for going into a war without checking with him first. And at first he wouldn't authorize the oil to bail out Europe and they had to have rationing and everything else. Eventually, when they agreed to, to leave Egypt, um, he did agree to uh, provide their supplies. Another thing that uh, Eisenhower did was the interstate highway system. You want to talk about things that have revolutionized energy use today, where we build our houses, how we take our vacations. Uh, he had to uh, uh, increase the federal gasoline tax from uh, two cents to four cents a gallon. And uh, there was an oil executive who testified before Congress that if we were gonna raise the gasoline tax by two cents, it was clear that people were gonna quit driving and this was gonna be the end of uh, transportation in the United States. I would say that uh, highways, interstate highways have had almost the exact uh, opposite. He got involved in the natural gas uh, price issue. Uh, Congress actually passed a law that deregulated natural gas prices. Most economists thought that was a good idea. Eisenhower thought it was a good idea. But there had been a scandal uh, attached to it, and the uh, natural gas industry was accused of paying cash bribes to members of the Senate. And one Senate actually held up an envelope of cash that he alleged was a bribe. Uh, and so Eisenhower uh, sent a message saying that I agree with this act, but the stench surrounding it is so great that I could not in good conscience uh, sign the bill because it would be an affront to the American people. So he actually vetoed a bill he agreed with because he thought it was, had been passed uh, on an Ill illegitimate basis. Very interesting perspective uh, back in the 1950s. And then Eisenhower does something very important in 1959 that has a tremendous impact on our national uh, 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 future. And this is a point I was making this morning, I'm kind of reemphasizing it here. Our next president may make uh, decisions about energy that we won't even know what the impacts of them are for 5, 10, 20 years. It's only looking back we'll be able to know whether it was a wise policy or not. And Eisenhower in 1959, or 79, encouraged by a, a Democratic Congress, which was run by Sam Rayburn of Texas, and that was the Speaker of the House. Lyndon Johnson was the Majority Leader of the Senate, so Texas had a lot of clout. Eisenhower puts a quota on foreign oil imports, and the way it was set up, it virtually banned any imports from the Middle East. So from 1959 to April of 1973, we had a virtual ban on Im imported oil into the United States if it came from the Middle East. We, we, didn't, we had some restrictions on oil coming from Canada and Venezuela, uh, some from Indonesia, but they weren't as stringent as they were on the Middle East. So um, that ends up, uh, the year after this, OPEC is formed, because OPEC is saying, we're, you know, we thought this was supposed to be a free market out there. Uh, you, you have shut us off from your market. 
So we're going to form our own cartel. Whether OPEC would have ever been formed if we hadn't blocked our access to our market, we'll, we'll never know, but it's an interesting uh, question. Okay, here I'm going to jump ahead a little bit uh, to uh, George Bush the father, or as we say in the presidential library business, Bush 41. Uh, the reason I'm skipping is there's a lot that goes on in the 70s, but I kind of touched on it um, in uh, my talk this morning. Uh, I touch on it in my book, so I, I don't feel the need to go over it again. And um, so I'm going to jump to Bush uh, 41. Remember I talked this morning about appliance efficiency standards. The first president to actually issue rules on appliance efficiency standards was George Herbert Walker Bush. The legislation had been passed under President Reagan. Um, there was some um, legislation passed under President Carter, which you mentioned this morning, but it wasn't strong enough to actually uh, support rulemaking. So um, the, the laws passed under President Reagan, President Herbert, George Herbert Walker Bush comes in and puts in appliance efficiency standards. He, um, okay, um, he uh, dealt with Um, so he uh, had to deal with the Exxon Valdez oil spill, which was an offshoot of the, uh, I mentioned this morning, the many, many positive aspects of the Alaska, uh, Alaska oil pipeline. Um, and, uh, uh, but it had a downside. You had to switch up uh, at uh, the uh, Valdez, you had to switch the oil to a tanker. They had a massive oil spill there, set back oil for quite a while. He also was involved in revisions to the Clean Air Act, which uh, uh, tamped down on sulfur. Uh, he would have been accused, I guess, of being anti-coal. Uh, and as, it introduced a system of tax uh, cap and trade, which was a system that was developed in the revisions to the Clean Air Act as a way of, of tamping down on sulfur. He expelled Iran from Iraq. Was that an energy policy? I would argue it was. The documents that have been declassified now uh, make it clear that um, um, uh, the major incentive to go in there was to protect U.S. access to oil. Uh, I've spoken to groups of generals and others, and they've all come up after we assured me that's the case. Uh, and uh, so, you know, part of maintaining that access is the uh, willingness to take military action when necessary. And he also signed the Rio Treaty on Climate Change. Well, I'm just getting started here, but uh, we, we could go with, with all the presidents. Uh, I, this is kind of a hobby of mine to look at how presidents have treated energy. And, um, you know, every president has. I think President Bush, um, the 43, will have to be looked at as two different presidents. I think he had a set of policies during his first term that were quite different than the second term. The second term he did sign in 2007, Energy Efficiency, Energy Independence and Conservation Act, which I argue may end up being the most impactful energy package ever passed. Uh, and But people have a hard time uh, comprehending that because they have a stereotype of Bush that may not always be, be accurate. So I'm going to stop there as to not intrude on the time of the other panelists. And uh, anybody that wants to talk more about presidents and history, I got a lot more. Uh, I, th I think it's fascinating. We're always fascinated in our presidents and what they do because everything, the politics, the science, the economics all comes together at the White House and they have to sort it all out. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to be making this interactive here uh, very shortly. We're about to hear from Ken Kogut for 10 minutes, and uh, then we're going to hear from David Nemso, and then we're going to turn it to you, and we're going to give you the opportunity to pose questions, and there'll be time limits on the responses, three-minute responses from each of the presenters. And uh, Jay, if you want to weigh in on those, those Q&A, we will certainly do that. I would ask that folks in the audience uh, turn off your cell phones, if anyone has any difficulty hearing, please raise your hand. Now it's a pleasure to introduce Ken Kogut. And Ken is a native Chicagoan. As I said, he's a past president here at AEE, member of the AEE Hall of Fame. He's a uh, great fan of the Chicago White Sox, is a native Chicagoan. And he's pinch hitting today for Makai Campbell, who's the staff director of the Senate Energy Committee. And it's a pleasure to have Ken with us. He is uh, very, very well qualified for his pinch hitter role. He has worked with clients in the energy field in the commercial, industrial, and government sectors, designing and implementing energy management systems for many, many years. He has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering and a master's degree in engineering from the University of Detroit. 
and he also has a PhD in engineering management from La Crosse University. Um, he has a very fascinating background. I had the pleasure to meet Ken for the first time only last night. Learned that he once played with Count Basie. So uh, we're delighted, Ken, to have you with us. You have 10 minutes. You may speak from your desk or, or here at the podium. And uh, thank you so much for stepping up to uh, this debate this afternoon. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Jay, thank you very much for your comments, too. I'd like to say welcome also for my counterpart, uh, David. Looking forward to the interaction today. So. Uh, as you know, um, uh, there's going to be basically two sides, but you know, it, it, uh, there was a gentleman yesterday, uh, Dr. Walker, who I mentioned, we had a discussion at, uh, at the um, uh, 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 AE uh, uh, dinner last night, and before then, uh, we talked about both sides, Democratic and Republican. And my way of uh, presenting both sides, I will do it in a very visual manner. And I said, Dr. Walker, I says, as you know, I understand your position and I'm sure that you understand mine. And the position is this, we have Democrats on one side and we have Republicans on the other. But that's not the issue. This is where it should be. And he congratulated me for that. And that's the basis of what we, should, what we need to look at. You can hear both sides of energy issues. You know, it's my background goes back to the design of uh, nuclear power plants. I was involved with the design of three plants, which I'm proud to say. It's a Guani nuclear plant, which is a 500 megawatt uh, pressurized water reactor, Westinghouse, and uh, uh, also Prairie Island 1 and 2 for Northern States Power, also uh, 500 megawatt pressurized water reactors. Uh, the, those are some of the three of the most uh, uh, economical and efficient plants that are operating today of 104 nuclear energy plants. Uh, there's three on the docket that are coming on. One is going to be here in Georgia, and there's two others uh, scheduled for the, for, the, for, the, for the country right now. I think one is going to be in the, T, in the Tennessee Valley uh, uh, area. But to take a look at where we're at for the energy issues, um, where we're at from a Republican standpoint, and I apologize for even st stating it that way, but what we need to take a look at here is not so much as uh, drill, baby, drill. What we need to look at is how do we develop a comprehensive policy which includes nuclear, coal, oil, and renewables, as you heard uh, Governor Mitt Romney. The important issues that we want to take a look at, obviously, are minimizing uh, carbon footprint. Nuclear does that in a very handsome way. I was involved with some of the first SO2 scrubbers uh, for coal plants down in Kentucky back in the early 70s. Uh, I've also been involved with a number of designs for taking a look at uh, some of the uh, uh, more uh, efficient coal plants that you're seeing here for clean coal technology. It does exist, and we can do and we can do it. An important fact, which I think some of you know, but I will restate it: the proven and unproven energy reserves for oil and gas in this country are larger than Saudi Arabia and South America combined. That's an interesting statement. And yet, we look, why is the price of gas going up at, uh, at the pump? Well, sometimes, uh, let's just say there's interesting plays in the market that, uh, that, that come to play with this. But what's more important, I think, is that, <clears throat> pardon me, is that when you take a look at uh, where the policies are generated, it's the people who should come out and say, this is what we need. And I think there's going to be a point in relation to development of policy that it may it may take a while yet, but it's starting to 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 get some inroads as far as how we look at the situation of where we're at today. Because you know what, the president doesn't pay my taxes, the governor Mitt Romney doesn't pay my taxes, he doesn't pay my gas bill or my oil bill or any other bill. I pay that bill as you pay your bills. And you should take a look at that and say, where are we at this point? And who can be able to assist in developing a comprehensive plan to be able to take a look at where we're at and where we need to go? The implementation of, of the, the, the philosophical impetus of developing a plan which is comprehensive based upon the, the principles of which I, I formally laid out would be the best way to take a look at this. Integration of renewables such as solar and wind are fine, but the sun doesn't shine 24-7 and the wind doesn't blow 24-7. The problem with that is that we, this is going to be a uh, uh, carbon-based 
society for my lifetime, for our children's lifetime, and our grandchildren's lifetime. After that, I'm not so sure where we're going to go, but I do know post-2030 is going to be an interesting time to live in. That's the way I phrase it. And post-2030 is going to be an interesting time. So with that, thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Ken. <clears throat> very nicely done. Now it's a pleasure to introduce David Nemso of Nemso & Associates in the Los Angeles area. David has a very varied career in energy policy. He's uh, worked really the breadth of the issue. He has a uh, undergraduate degree from Brown University, a master's in public policy from Harvard. He has worked in uh, energy policy on Capitol Hill for Congressman Ed Markey, as you know, the champion of the, uh, the Markey-Waxman uh, climate legislation. He has run a national energy efficiency organization, the Alliance to Save Energy, for nearly 10 years. The Alliance is one of the premier energy efficiency organizations in the world. And he has also worked for the um, province of New South Wales, Australia. He was the uh, CEO and director of the State Energy, Water, and uh, Utility Department of New South Wales, which is the most populous state in Australia. And he is uh, currently engaged in consulting, and he's going to speak to us for 10 minutes on the democratic perspective on energy issues in the campaign. David, welcome. Thanks. Thanks for I will stand. Thanks very much, Brad. I've been sitting, sitting for days. And thanks, uh, thank you all for uh, organizing this at uh, the World Energy Engineering Congress and AEE, and to Brad and Jay and to Ken. I want to express my personal appreciation to Ken, who has a very tough job of pinch hitting at the last minute and the even tougher job of defending some of the energy policies of Republicans. <laughs> I've been waiting since lunch to say that. <laughs> Believe me, I won't interrupt you too much. <laughs> <laughs> we just said those guys do that. And so, um, thanks very much. I have been active in energy and policy and, and politics uh, my entire uh, life and career. And, and I gotta say, and, and what Jay Hakes said, you know, I found sadly telling. When you compare that video to what Jay said, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to characterize it this way. And she didn't, they, they didn't used to be an issue called Democratic versus Republican energy policy, and, and, and Ken talked about that. Abraham Lincoln started the National Academy of Sciences, and now we see many in the Republican Party who are attacking science and have, want nothing to do with science. Um, we saw that uh, the first President Bush started cap and trade. If Senator uh, Brown from Massachusetts, if he doesn't uh, uh, win next week in the election, I think he's the last Northeastern Republican left, and certainly uh, no Republican candidates in the Senate talk, even can talk about cap and trade anymore after the first President Bush a Republican signed it, and uh, we heard about appliance uh, standards. So it used to, and the group that I work for, and, and Brad too, the Alliance to Save Energy, was founded by a Republican, Charles Percy of Illinois. And so it used to be, this was not a wedge issue. And then to see the two candidates fight about it, and, and, and uh, Michelle and whoever edited that tape, clearly you're a very substantive person because you took out all the fisticuffs. <laughs> and if you saw the Saturday Night Live version of that, they didn't, it was the easiest SNL ever. They didn't have to spoof anything because the two candidates really went at it over energy issues as much as anything. And that's both interesting it's, uh, as I think you said, Jay, it's fun for those of us in this business. On the other hand, it's a little bit sad that we're in this position. Having said that, with an election six days away, uh, you know, I really, when I was invited to do this, I had a hard time thinking about the differences between Democratic and Republican energy policy. And when I worked for Congressman Markey of Massachusetts, we spent a good time, a good deal of our time working with Republicans from consuming states and fighting Democrats like Bennett Johnson from Louisiana. So those lines didn't quite feel right. But these times have changed. And I'm going to say sadly, but a little bit sharp elbowed, that this election, energy has become a wedge issue. And while I regret that, I'm going to take that opportunity and try to emphasize some of the differences between President Obama and Governor Romney on these issues. And so I'm going to turn this a little bit from a Democratic Republican issue to an Obama Romney issue. And I know many of you here, if you're anything like most Americans, 49% of you are going to vote one way, and 51% of you are going to vote the other way. <laughs> we don't know which way that is. <laughs> so we're going to find out in a few days. I see my friend Malcolm Verdict. I know how you're voting. I know how I'm voting. I know how Ken's voting. After that, the rest of you guys, 
we'll, we'll find out. So I, I did tell you I was going to vote. <laughs> it's a secret ballot. I like to see a rational Republican who's willing to look at the facts <laughs> and do what's necessary for this country. So let me, tell you, let me give you my sense of what President Obama has done in his first term in office, and, and I think all of this I would call democratic energy policy. And, um, and these are the things that he's committed to do in the second term. And he's committed in every way a president can, a politician can. He said it on TV before 70 million Americans. He's put out issue papers. But again, I think the real proof for any of us in a democracy is to look how they've acted in the first term uh, in their time in office and say, what does that mean for the second term? The first thing I want to say about the president's energy policy is his energy policy or policies, plural, I think uh, is fine, are really part of something bigger that this president's trying to do, and that is restore the economic growth, the macroeconomy that uh, he inherited after the uh, uh, collapse of the finance markets and Lehman Brothers in 2008. And so everything he does on energy, you can hear it in the way he talks, um, is part of a, uh, a strategy on economic growth, on competitiveness, on job uh, uh, re creation and restoration. So that's the first thing to keep in mind. It's not, yeah, it, of course it touches the national security and the environment and all those other things, but it's really part of uh, his macroeconomic approach. Second uh, to that, and I'm counting jobs, but second only to that, it's part of this president's view towards infrastructure. And I want to come back and talk particularly about some of the spending that happened under the stimulus bill. But he sees it as part of infrastructure development, looking forward um, uh, to the next, uh, uh, the energy needs of the future. Again, not unlike Abraham Lincoln. He has embraced an all of the above energy philosophy, and you heard some nice sharp words from both candidates there. Both candidates say they're for all of the above. That's smart, it's a good policy, and it's, and it's good when you're running for president. I, I will submit, though, that one candidate is doing it more this and that. I'm gonna save my, my sharpest statements for this, and that is President Obama has done that in his first term, has increased uh, oil production, both, uh, a lot of that has happened on his ter term anyway, is the lowest imports have been in nearly two decades, over 16 years, highest oil production has been in years. Some of that is due to the government action, some of it is not, it's, it's naturally occurring. Um, Natural gas production, the highest it's been. Uh, nuclear, we're restarting the nuclear industry. Uh, that has been more abundant uh, for decades, as we heard from Ken. Uh, renewables have doubled. Uh, this year, renewable uh, generation, it starts with a smaller base, of course, than the other fuels, but renewables has grown much more quickly than anything else. Um, uh, clean coal spending, this president has invested $5 billion in clean coal more than others, other presidents, and of course, energy efficiency demand side management, fuel economy standards, uh, and the smart grid. And so he does have all of the above. I do want to contrast that to Governor Romney. And, and speaking of history, I'm going to contrast it to this Governor Romney, not the Governor Romney who's governor of Massachusetts. And my other joke of the day is Governor Romney was for fighting climate change before he was against fighting <laughs> climate change. And he, he has changed on these issues. And, and, there's, there's, and that's right. There, they're allowed to evolve. And I'm going to talk about the current Governor Romney. The current one running for president uh, put out a, a, a 20, I think, three page uh, energy policy in August um, that was his comprehensive plan. He doesn't even mention energy efficiency. He does, the words don't exist in it. And I've looked under other terms. There's no conservation, there's no efficiency, there's no demand side management. It's, 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 it's. It's, un I, you know, I'd say it's the 50s, but I guess Jay would correct me, it's the 1850s. It's not even the 1950s. To have an energy policy that doesn't mention our most abundant, cheapest, cleanest energy source. And we, we heard at lunch today, the uh, gentleman from Saudi Aramco, we heard, we know we're the Saudi Arabia of many things, but we're certainly the Saudi Arabia of energy efficiency in this country. I don't think I have to tell any of you in this room of all our opportunities there. Uh, Governor uh, Candidate Romney has also called wind and solar uh, uncompetitive. We can talk about that. It's called the much ballyhooed. And he said that green jobs are going to hurt the economy more than help them. So I, I don't think that counts as, as all of the above. The, the main point I'd like to make, I'm happy to talk about any of the energy issues as best I can help, but I think the main point I'd like to make about the, the uh, 
President Obama's approach and how he would uh, work in the second term. I'm going to use a, a couple of examples from the first term, and I'd like to talk uh, mostly about two of them. One of them is the CAFE fuel economy standards. And these are the ones that started under uh, President Carter. And these are the standards, of course, for fuel automobile economy. They are going to double, just, just almost double, not quite by model year 2025, to 54.5 miles per gallon uh, for cars and light duty trucks, 54.5. But that's not the most amazing part. And I think that's not the part that uh, I want to give, and I think the president deserves credit for. The thing that he deserves credit for is that he just short of double the fuel economy standards with the support of the big three automakers and with the support of the United Auto Workers Union. And to me, that is, is truly remarkable. That's one of the reasons why the story hasn't been well told, because it wasn't one of those classic Washington fights with the uh, long knives out. It was something done in a, in a concerted, organized way with all parties uh, uh, you know, at the table. And I think that's the right way to govern. I think it came up with the right answer for this issue. By, by raising fuel economy standards to, uh, to that level, uh, that's as good as lowering gasoline prices. Of course, we all wish, and certainly anybody running for re-election wishes gasoline were $2 a gallon, but the world markets are where they are. But the fuel economy standards will lower, uh, will lower bills, lower energy consumption, lower the pollution with it. And again, it was done in a science-based, consensus-oriented fashion that I think is admirable in all parties deserve credit for it. And, and I won't speak to a group of uh, engineers and others without saying it's only because of good engineering that allows that to happen, uh, that that's even a policy option. The other point, the other example that I like to raise is the spending under the stimulus plan. And of course, the spending for the stimulus, the uh, 900 or so billion dollars is controversial. And whether you support that or oppose that, I think what's, uh, that, that I don't want to, I'm not going to address whether at that point, but what I'd like to say is within that spending, what the U.S. did is very different than what other industrial democracies did. When Europe had stimulus spending uh, of lower levels, but what they did is a lot of short-term growth. They did a lot of pothole fixing because they wanted to get people back to work immediately. That's fine. That's reasonable. What the U.S. did under uh, uh, the administration's leadership is not only do the pothole fixing and get people back to work immediately, but heavy investment in infrastructure namely, in, in our field, energy efficiency, demand response, and mostly the smart grid. There were billions of dollars let out in competitive smart grid grants for, uh, you know, for the whole bit is, as I, I suspect you know, for advanced meters and for energy storage. And that investment in infrastructure, which doesn't create jobs as quickly as some of the other measures, creates jobs in the long term. And that's the final point I like to make, and that's the future-oriented approach. Of course, you have to govern uh, looking towards the future, and I think that approach, that investment in, in efficiency and demand side, but in the infrastructure, uh, even during the, the periods of economic uh, crisis, really uh, showed the difference. So I think it's been a very thoughtful administration. I think the second term would be too. I hope we do get to a world where there isn't a difference between Democratic and Republican energy policy. But in the meantime, there are some differences in vision, and I just and I should also say uh, the climate issue um, that. Um, uh, again, a rejection of science by some parties' part is really unfortunate. I think we can get past that, and I hope you do. Thanks again for having me today. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, now we get to the fun part of the program where you have an opportunity to weigh in with your views and questions. And the way it's going to work, we have a microphone in the center of the room. If you have a question or a comment, it doesn't need to be a question, it can be in the form of a comment. Please go to the microphone, identify yourself by name and your organization, and who you'd like to direct the question to. And uh, if it is a question, then uh, David and Ken will each have three minutes to respond. And uh, then we, if you want to redirect, if you feel your question wasn't answered, we'll have time for a brief follow-up. So uh, I think we have our first questioner. Ma'am, could you please identify yourself? Hi, I'm Natasha Pasalo, and I'm with Train. And I have a question for Ken Colbert. Okay. Uh, we had eight years of Republican leadership. What steps did the Republican Party make during that time to drill on the proven or even look into the unproven land at that time? What details do you have regarding that? To my knowledge, uh, under, Bush's, under Bush, 
the, uh, the proven reserves have increased and the unproven reserves have increased. Unfortunately, blocking Alaskan uh, 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 pipeline uh, uh, at this point, uh, when it's taken a look, even to Keystone was even discussed during uh, under Bush's uh, administration, but was never really formalized until um, uh, more recently. Things don't happen overnight. But more importantly, the, uh, uh, the idea of taking a look at more uh, private uh, uh, drilling occurred rather than on the uh, 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 federal lands. And Bush opened up more federal land built, uh, drillings than uh, under the current uh, Democratic or Obama administration. The, the basic philosophy is the difference, and uh, I'd have to go back to a statement which, uh, which, which David mentioned. Uh, the stimulus plan, which you take a look at what currently is, it's, there's a difference between what Romney's looking at as a growth plan, which should have been placed and put in place, rather than the stimulus plan, which has uh, been a detriment to uh, paybacks and uh, different philosophies. So I, I don't want to get into, you know, uh, a, a name calling or anything, that's not the issue here. What the issue here is, what you had mentioned, is relation to the, 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 the philosophy in terms of how the, the, the drilling has occurred, and it has occurred and pro, uh, progressed under uh, under the Bush plan. David, you have three minutes to comment on that if you choose to. The uh, agreement that their, their reserves had gone up, and, and again, every president, you know, uh, to remind me, Jay, every president since I want to say Truman has promised energy independence. It's a, a, an elusive goal. Uh, you know, it's a it's a goal that uh, I think we'll all be surprised if it's actually met. On the other hand, imports have gone down dramatically in the past few years, and they have to do with all sorts of reasons, including technological development. Uh, and we can list whichever ones we like, and, and 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 the growth in natural gas that's displaced a lot of oil. I think what's most important is not to look at one single factor. The, the focus on federal lands, I, I gotta say I don't quite follow. After the BP, after the, uh, the disaster in the Gulf, yeah, a lot of, a lot of uh, drilling was shut down on federal lands and permits were uh, reviewed. Uh, big surprise there. So what's important, I think, is that those reserves have a process in front of them to, if they're on public lands, to be able to, uh, uh, to be developed, not that, you know, and going through all the, the proper procedures to look at their environmental consequences. And one example that'll happen, again, that sort of, it's, it's like the nuclear example that sort of confounds people that a Democrat would do this, is the, there's now, um, uh, they've issued permits for drilling off the Arctic waters. And that was something that was totally not accepted a few years ago. So all this can be done right. Reserves are there, uh, the technology's improving, and I don't know, I'm going to be a little bit optimistic. I think there, there may be a way that, uh, to a large degree to have it all. Thank you very much. Uh, do you consider that a satisfactory answer to your question? You want to follow up? No, I do not really. I, I don't think that it's really satisfactory. From, from this side, I thought it was a great answer. From, <laughs> from the other side, the reason I was asking is because um, when you mentioned the fact that we have so much un, so much land that we could drill on more than Saudi Arabia, well, that makes me wonder why aren't we doing something about it? And is it just this administration that hasn't taken the necessary steps to drill? And if so, I wanted to know the Republicans have had the, the House for eight years and they've had it at other times. Why hadn't they drilled on this land so that we wouldn't be right now dependent on, on foreign oil? But I, I think that I probably have the the answer that, that I'm going to get. Well, we're going to give Ken an opportunity, and then Jay. So you each take three minutes. The, basically, if you, uh, if you if you understood my first response, that uh, under uh, under the Bush plan, which is what you're referring to, uh, the eight years under Bush, is that federal lands were being drilled upon, and then uh, I, I, deferring to uh, to David, obviously under the BP spill, uh, th things were uh, sucked, shut down. That. Uh, Let's just say suddenly, but from a safety factor, I concur absolutely it's a safety factor. But however, to be able to say that, to take a look at, let's, let's, could, let's not take a look at drilling on, on those particular lands, and the private sector is where it said, well look, we gotta move along, and yet the private sector is moving along at a faster pace than the federal lands. 
Now, we're only taking a look at those two issues. However, when you take a look at gas exploration under the Bush administration, that, ex that, that exploded. And you're taking a look at where some of the areas of gas exploration are now coming to, to, uh, 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 are, are coming to surface now, where before it was only talked about and, and talked about as an unproven reserve. Now they're talking about these being proven reserves, such as in Pennsylvania. You're taking a look at Western Pennsylvania is a phenomenal area for one of the largest gas uh, uh, exploration and uh, deposits we're taking a look at for this country. So that needs to be taken a look at in a very serious manner. Uh, and from there, we just take a look at uh, 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 issues which would be embellished upon, which would allow for a consummate plan, period. Thank you. Jay. Ask you to come up to the uh, podium and then we'll get this uh, turned on. Let me just give some guidelines on how everybody can answer this question for themselves. Uh, for sale, and I actually don't know what the answer is, uh, when the government uh, has uh, federal lands, they put it up for a lease sale. Uh, these lease sales will yield uh, billions of dollars of, of revenue for the government. And uh, you can go to the Department of, of uh, Interior website and it will have all the lease sales under both administrations. You can add them up by the number of years in their office and see how much it was. I, I don't know if there's that much difference. I mean, they both have done these sales, and both President George W. Bush and President Obama have had restrictions. It was not until the last year of Bush 43's administration that we opened up Florida. Both Democrats and Republicans were against drilling in Florida. Why? Because Florida was against offshore drilling, and they were a swing state both in the primaries and in the general election. The governor of Florida changed his position, and that allowed other people change their position. Uh, on the reserves issue, be careful about definitions of reserves. The terms are not used in consistent ways across different countries. Uh, Venezuela and Canada re recently leapt up to number two and three in the world in proven reserves, not because they had any more oil, but because they redefined how they, how they uh, defined uh, uh, reserves. So it's a very, very tricky area, but it, as we take this unconventional oil and gas and move it into proven reserves, we are certainly seeing a very optimistic point of view uh, in the United States. But you, you again, looking at reserves issue, you can go to the EI website uh, and, and look at the trends in reserves. Uh, they're looking pretty positive. Jay, thank you very much. David, in the interest of time, I'm going to move on to uh, the next question. Uh, sir, could you please identify yourself and your organization? Sure. Mitch, uh, Mitch Boucher. Uh, and Who I are you with, Mitch? Okay. <laughs> I'm an EE member. So I'm here for myself today. All right. <laughs> Taxpayer and citizen. Uh, here, here. I happen to have those numbers from the Bureau of Land Management and the leases. Could you speak a little closer to the microphone? I happen to have those Good. numbers from the Bureau of Land Management and leases. And in 2010 was the lowest number of leases we've had in the last 20 years. And that was 12,000 leases. Uh, 2011 was 20,000 leases, 2009 was 20,000 leases, and then from there it goes up to 28,000 leases back through 2006. What about so offshore? This is only the offshore from the Bureau of Land Management. Right there. So yeah, there is a parse in the words when we say oil production versus number of leases. The number of leases are definitely down. Um, but my question is, and I think it's to both, um, but I'd like to hear um, David's. David's going to go first and then Ken. Yeah, David's answer first. Um, there's a Congressional Research Service report uh, that the Government Accountability Office has reviewed that shows that there's um, 578 coal plants built before 1978. And those coal plants amount for 60% of all the emissions for all of the power production in the U.S. Um, hundreds of those were before 1965. And that date's important because that's when we invented color television. So most of our coal plants today, 60% of the emissions are from these old 578 coal plants. Now for Ken's first point was we need to work together. And David's first point was we need to create jobs. A coal plant built in 2010 has 90% less emissions than those old coal plants. Why wouldn't we just go build all brand new, efficient, 
clean coal plants today. Okay, David, you have three minutes. The, uh, well, thanks, thanks for that, thanks for that question. So I think you raise you, you raise a lot of good points there. So the first is um, implicit, and that is technology has advanced so far, and a lot of these plants. What you didn't say is they're not they're not even because they're grandfathered, not even subject to the Clean Air Act. And and I'll add when you hear people say and, and some one of the candidates say, oh, there's a war on coal, or the you know why do you want to shut down coal plants? Yeah, I don't think that's the case, but I do think it's clear that uh, coal-fired power plants that have been around since the 60s and some since the 50s, they don't have to face the Clean Air Act. Those days are over and should be over. I mean, for them to have to face no responsibility, which I think is implicit in your question, is, is, is uh, I don't know, I'd call it an absurdity if, it, if the consequences weren't so great. To your point, new technology in just about every case is better than the old. And you gave the example of coal, we could do the same with, with automobiles, we could do the same with refrigerators, we could do the same, right, with you pick it. So the question is how do we get there? I think there are several ways. Number one, and only some of which are the federal government's responsibilities. Number one, when it comes to power plants, this is mostly going to be state activity. This is really the stuff of utilities and state utility commissions. And of course, the feds have a role there, but they have a secondary role. And what I would say, and I think the right energy policy is, and I'll, I'll assign it to the Democrats, is that what should happen is there should be a comprehensive uh, uh, way to make these decisions that look at all the options. So you said, why not replace it with new coal that has 10% uh, of the emissions? That might be the right answer in some places. In other places, it's gonna be wind with 0% of the emissions. In many places, it's gonna be energy efficiency, uh, demand response, or it's gonna be a mix of things. It's gonna be renewables. Of course, Ken's right, the sun and the wind are intermittent. Nuclear, you can't throttle up and down, so energy storage needs to advance technologically to help all of those sources. So I think, so I, I'd like to agree with you that we need to either uh, uh, upgrade those older plants or replace them, but it should be with whatever serves the local needs, and it may be coal, it may not. A lot of those decisions, though, will be state and utility based on all sorts of factors, of which emissions should be key, but of course it won't be the only one. 